Good morning, everybody. Coming to you from uh, our home in Port Jeff Station. It's uh, Sunday morning, April 26, 2020, and I'm uh, representing Harborview Christian Church. This is our message for this week. It's been about, this is probably the sixth week that we haven't been in church, um, and we miss you guys so much. We really do. We miss being together, and I'm sure the whole congregation miss, misses being together. We miss our pastor, Pete, and his wife, Doreen, and we miss Paul's announcements, and we miss Paul's prayers, and we miss our worship leader, and uh, our little band, and our fellowship, and our time with you. But this too will pass. God is sovereign. He's on his throne, and he is in charge. And we have modern technology that we're learning how to use, and... Uh, and this is a great opportunity for us to do a couple things. Learn how to use this modern technology and draw close to God. And also develop relationships with each other. Reach out for, to people. You know, there's people that are hurting a great deal. People who are physically, um, financially, emotionally, and spiritually hurting. And we could be a great, great guide for, for each other. Um, great help for each other. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this congregation. Thank you for this word. Thank you for your word that you sent your son, and thank you for your word that you spoke. Thank you for this, the, the messages of the Bible, for the, the theme, the continuous theme of Christ. And thank you for allowing us to be your people. Please guide us. Please allow me to get out of the way so that your message could be spoken through me today. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, today's talk is the principles for sharing our faith. And first question is, what is faith? Well, the author of Hebrews says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation, and that's approval. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The author spends the rest of the chapter, this 11th chapter, giving a biblical history and how those we consider the righteous characters of the Bible were not saved by their works, but were in fact saved by faith. And we being on the other side of our Savior are now saved by believing in him, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, believing that he is who he said he is, as we're told in John 6:40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus actually addressed us when Thomas finally recognized him for who he was. And Thomas said the most famous words, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed Thomas because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Have you ever considered Jesus was speaking about us? That's pretty cool. It makes me smile every time I think of it. He wants you to acknowledge that he is your Lord and your God. So this leads to why do we share our faith? Well, after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he met his disciples for one last instruction, and we call it the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it's an important scripture for Christians to know because it's a commission. We've been directed. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Wow, there's a lot of absolutes in that. All authority. 
in heaven and earth has been given to him. Well, that means all of us are under that authority. All of us have been commissioned to do this. And we've been commissioned to go and make disciples. Again, in other absolute, all nations. And what are we to do? We're to baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're to teach them to observe his commands. And he's with us always. So it's not partial authority, some authority, most authority, a lot of authority. It's all authority. And that's our command. So Jesus is saying to them, you walked with me for three years. You lived with me. I taught you. You witnessed my death. You've spoken to me and eaten with me and touched me since I've been resurrected. And... I spent the last couple days at the right hand of the Father, and now I have this authority to give you this command. I don't know about you, that seems pretty powerful. It seems like a pretty powerful commission. And he wants us to take this faith. He wants them to take their faith and us to take our faith and actually put it into action. So how do we share our faith? Well, we have two great, um, <laughs> two great apologists um, in the Bible, and they give us two great um, scriptures for us to, to, to remember. And I don't believe that I was asked to speak today because I have some magic bullet, because I have some uh, great success in sharing my faith. Um, I have a lot of family members, a lot of friends, a lot of people I love dearly, who I have uh, spilt my heart out to, and it hasn't uh, changed, hasn't appeared to change anything for them. But there's something pretty uh, reassuring. It's not my responsibility to convert them. This is God's work. I believe that Pastor Pete asked me to speak on this subject because I have a great burden on my heart for sharing my faith. I take the opportunities that are presented to me, and I'm bold. Now, as a kid, I was raised a Jehovah's Witness, and that did a few things. It taught me um, to be bold in my faith, to go to people's doors, you know, seven, eight years old. Do that at seven, eight, nine years old, and have the chance of one of your friends from school answering the door. That'll show you you got to be, you know, you, you got to be bold because you face these fears early on. Um, and it also put a burden on me because I spent a good part of my life, the first 20 years of my life, believing something. And teaching something and sharing something that I now feel is a false gospel with a false, false Christ, a Christ that couldn't save. And so now I'm, perhaps maybe I'm trying to undo some stuff that I had done. Let's look at the examples of Peter and Paul. In 1 Peter 3.15 we read, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always another absolute, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. In 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26, we have Paul's letter to Timothy, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So, we're always to make a defense. We're not to be defensive about it. It's not our burden. It's not our responsibility. Sharing is our burden. That's our responsibility. Converting people isn't. That's the mindset. Look for the opportunities. Be bold. Be kind. Do it with respect. Well, let's, this leads us to another question. How are we saved? Well, the Apostle Paul says it's the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's how we're saved, the gospel. So the next question would naturally lead to, well, what is it? We speak about this good news, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the cults do, a lot of people do, who have access to the Bible. And they speak about the gospel, they speak about the good news. I think it's important we have a firm understanding of what it is and where to find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Here it is, guys. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel right there. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. Now he's going to back it up. And he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, to all the apostles. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. There's significance to that, though some have fallen asleep. There's 500 eyewitnesses to them. They're still alive. Go seek them out. Don't just take my word for it. You will find these people. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as, one, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. He was about their age. I think when he's talking about being born untimely, timing, he's talking about his rebirth. He's talking about his road to Damascus. He's talking about going from Saul to Paul. And that's pretty heartwarming. It's pretty cool to, to look at it like that. That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, that's where we find it. How can we share it? Well, Dare to Share Ministry has three A's that they like to, uh, to show. Just for, this is just for simplification purposes, okay? Three A's, you want to talk to somebody, how do you start? Ask. Ask somebody. You're looking for these opportunities. You're a Christian. People know that you're a Christian. If it's somebody you just met, whether it's somebody you just met, somebody that's known you your whole life, you ask them about their beliefs. You know, Jesus asked more than 300 questions in the Bible, all within the four books of the Gospel, and he asked more questions in the Bible than anybody else in the Bible. And who was he? He, he existed for all time, eternity past. He knew every answer to every possible question, and here he is asking questions. Why do we think he was asking questions? He wanted to know what was going on in people's minds. He wanted to get them to think. Ask them about their faith. Ask them about their background. Ask them about their family. And ask them about what their belief system is. Do you go to church? What, you know, do you go to a synagogue, a mosque? This leads to admire. After asking people and finding out what's in their hearts and what's in their heads, there's certainly going to be things about that person that you can admire, that you can you can show some admiration about. And I don't care if the person is a, a Muslim, a Jew, a atheist, an agnostic, a Buddhist, a Hindu. You can admire. You can admire the fact that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons go door to door and give up their time to proselytize. I wish a lot of Christians had that kind of boldness. You can admire the fact that Jewish people will spend their life savings to educate their children and have their children grow up with this value system. You can admire the fact that Muslims have this conviction that five times a day they're going to spend time in prayer. You can admire the fact that an atheist or an agnostic doesn't just give up on life and take their life and raises, in many cases, raises their children to be, to be good people, to be made perhaps better people than our own children. Those are admirable qualities in other people, and when we recognize this, we're drawing them into us. We're learning something about them. We're creating a place to, a foundation with this person. And that leads to admit. Now this takes, the admit part takes some internal 
um, you know, some, some looking at why you're a Christian, okay? And it needs to be deeper than my mom and dad sent me to Sunday school and went to church every day. We need to go from feeding on milk to eating real meals. And we need to start to understand our faith, understand where we came from, understand who we are in the faith. And, and as Paul says, you know, when you were an infant, when you were a child, you ate and thought and spoke as a child. And now it's time to become men and women in faith. And part of this admit part, what I'm getting to, what I'm taking so long to get to, is whether you realize this or not, all of us were so broken, are so broken, that we realize we need a Savior. We realize we need to be saved. And if you didn't, if it's just because you grew up in a church environment and you're culturally a Christian, it's time to recognize what the gospel is and why it is that you need a Savior and, and who it is that we are. And this admission, when you're speaking to somebody, brings them to this point. This is the, this is the Ten Commandments. This is what has been asked of us. This is how it's impossible because Jesus came and said, it's even our thoughts that convict us. If you cursed your brother, you've committed murder. If you've coveted your neighbor's wife, you've committed adultery. That's, that's an impossible standard. That's why Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Okay? No one's good but God. We can't call ourselves good. So it's the gospel that saves Um how do we make the gospel message understandable? Excuse my dog who's yawning on the ground. Um, There's a pretty cool acrostic, making things easy to remember for sharing your faith. It uses the letters of the gospel, the G, the O, the S, the P, the E, and the L. G, God created us to be with him. And Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Oh, our sin separates us from God. So God created us to be with him, but the sin created this separation. For all have sinned, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. S, sins cannot be removed by good deeds. And this is my favorite verse, expo- expressing this, explaining this. There's other verses throughout Romans, Galatians, uh, almost all the epistles. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And P, paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose again. Two great scriptures for this is Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we've had this separation from God, but Jesus came and died and rose again take that away and e everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life a couple scriptures john 1 12 but to all who did receive him who believed in his name who gave the right to become children of god I've heard it said before god has no grandchildren he has sons and daughters and john three sixteen, for god so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And L, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. John 10, 28. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. A great example I love, love of this is when you have a child, a father with a child, an adult with a child, and you ask that child to take your hand to cross the street. The power of that handhold is not relying on the three-year-old, on the toddler. It's relying on the adult who is holding that child's hand. Your father is saying, your heavenly father, your perfect father, 
is saying that no one will snatch them out of my hand. Well, that's perseverance of the saints. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's the question. It's the question you ask the person that you have shared with. You want to know from them where they are. Is there anything holding them back? If there is, does it make sense? Review with them what you just spoke to them about. Um, and if if there's something holding them back right now from putting their faith in Jesus, then the answer is, if the answer is yes, then deal with that, okay? Go to Scripture, invite other Christians to help you talk to this person, um, find them help if they need it, whether it's prayer, whether it's professional help, spiritual help. Um, the, you know, there's plenty here just in this church of people who would love to, to help you. If the answer is no, there's nothing holding them back, well, that's incredible. Here is where you want to lead them in prayer. You want to make this real to them. You want them to realize that this comes from their heart, and this is between them and their God, between them and their Creator. And you're going to explain to them what it means to accept Jesus and what it means to repent, to turn away from your sin. As you lead them in prayer, realize you're not saving them. This is not, um, you know, this is not a, a salvation issue. This is time stamping their decision to become a follower of Jesus. They're, that that salvation, that that uh, you know, being justified, that's something that's going to happen on God's time. Um, but you certainly were being faithful in sharing with them the gospel message that has the power to save, as Paul described it. I'll take a moment just to, um, you know, I just wanted to point out that we all have life experiences. We're, we were all started life as children. Many of us have become husbands and wives and parents um, and grandparents. Many of us have, um, you know, to varying levels of education, different jobs, life experiences that come with us and based on who we are and how we learn and how we learn the bible we're able to share i will get, just give you a, a quick example of what was so powerful for me in coming to christ was you know i had told you about the first 20 years of my life being a, a witness the next 20 years of my life being a agnostic and then coming into the season where I felt there had to be something more out there and I wanted to learn about it. And I went into a lot of different um, directions and studied quite a bit, um, you know, whether it was Buddhism or various uh, Christian religions and um, did all different types of things. And as this was happening, I'm a, I'm a police officer, I'm, I'm a detective. And so I had seen a Christian apologist named Jay Warner Wallace, who's a cold case detective. And he told the story of the first Christians, of the apostles, who say, who, 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 by listening to the, the Great Commission, spread the gospel to the entire world, um, took down the Roman Empire, changed, changed everything. But the story of the apostles, for me, what resonated, for an investigator, for, for uh, somebody who has some experience in human nature, is that these people went from being cowards to sharing this message and saying, I don't care what happens to you. So if I have a witness who doesn't care that if they lie to me that they could be arrested, and I share that with them, and they're like, no, it doesn't matter. I'm going to sign right here, and I, I believe that this is what happened. This is what I saw. I want this, I, I want this person arrested. That becomes a more, um, that becomes a, a more powerful witness. If I have a witness that changes from writing about themselves in the first century about being a coward, about not being there when Jesus was resurrected, about the women being the eyewitnesses, and then they turn around and they say, well, we're going to spread this message to the entire world and we don't care if you arrest us 
persecute us, torture us, and kill us. The, the word hasn't changed. The, the truth hasn't changed. That's fascinating to me. And what that means to me and to a lot of people who do my type of work, who deal with witnesses and try to evaluate if a witness is credible or not, is like, wow, when, you point, when I point this out to people, it makes sense. In your profession, in your experience, there's going to be things in the Bible that are similar, things in the Bible that speak to you. And I would recommend that you look at the Bible from that perspective of how can, how does this relate to me? How can I relate to this? And how can I make this relatable to other people? So in conclusion, our faith is grounded in God's word that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We share our faith because we have been commissioned to. We've also been directed to defend our faith. We do not save people. God does. And he uses us to share the power of his gospel. So look for opportunities God has placed in your life. Ask, admire, admit why you needed Jesus. Pray about it and pray for boldness and pray for others and share the gospel. Share the story about a sovereign God's plan to save his people from eternity past. That man was created in God's image and created to live in union with God. That the first man and woman sinned and this sin could not exist in a perfectly holy God's presence. That God could have ended it all right there. But he didn't. He didn't end it all right there. He had a rescue plan for us. We inherited that sin, but he rescued us by sending his son into the world. And this son was stripped of his glory that he shared with the Father from eternity past. He didn't count equality with the Father a thing to grasp. He already had it. He let go of it. He instead took the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men in the most humble of beginnings. He lived the perfect life that we could never live. And he underwent the humiliation, torture, and death that we deserved. And he did this so that our sins, my sins, have been paid for. He then rose from the grave and took his rightful place in heaven at the right side of the Father. And now when God looks at you, when he looks at me, he sees his perfectly righteous son standing there. And if that isn't mind-blowing enough, try to realize the fact that if you were the only person on earth that would ever believe, this sacrifice would have still been necessary. And it would have still happened. It's powerful every time I tell that story. Every time I feel it in my heart. It might be a litmus test as to whether we're saved by the story because it's foolishness to those who don't believe. But it could be foolishness 99 times out of 100. And all you need is for that one time to hit that person's heart and that heart of stone will be turned into a heart of flesh. So we miss you. We miss all of you. We miss getting together. We miss being together. And we can't wait until this ends. Keep your faith. Know that God is greater than everything. He's sovereign. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this week. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our pastor, Pastor Pete and Doreen. Please encourage them. Please guide them. Please, please look after our congregation and allow us to know when we need to reach out to others. And let us do what we can. Please guide our leaders, our state, uh, national and world leaders, and please help us to get a hand on what's going on with this virus so that we're able to uh, step out and allow us to be bold in our faith. Pray all these things and thank you in Jesus' name.
Amen.